Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started with our next presentation. I'm extremely excited to have Dr. Akbar here. Um, she is a, a board certified clinical psychologist and a diversity, equity, and inclusion expert. Um, she's going to give her presentation on building equitable mental health services, but I want to do a really big plug for her. She has authored two books, and we have those books for sale in the vendor section, so please check them out. I know you want to now, but you're going to really, really, really want to after you hear this presentation. So be mindful of that. Also be mindful of the fact that we're actually giving two books away today. So we'll do that after this presentation. So thank you so much, Dr. Akbar. We'll have you guys give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can y'all hear me? I mean, I can talk loud, but is that is that good? More? Louder? You want me to be louder? You want me to get real loud? Let's get loud. No, it's, <laughs> don't let me get Beyonce on you. <laughs> I got the hair and everything. Um, okay, is that good? <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, you know, hello, hello, thank you. I want to thank um, Nadia for bringing me in um, and, and having this time and this moment to talk with all of you about something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is mental health. And I'm sure very near and dear to your heart because otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here, right? We oftentimes have to be reminded about our passion and why we do the things that we do. And this is one of those moments to bring that into your conscious awareness again, because sometimes it's like breathing. You don't remember why you do it. You get lost in when you're doing it. And then it isn't until somebody says, why are you doing this? How does this feel for you? You know, where's your passion around it? Do you remember um, the whole purpose of why you're here to begin with? So first, I want to make a couple of acknowledge acknowledgments. You know, um, it's important always to acknowledge the ancestral lands that we sit in, um, the lands that were stolen by the indigenous people of this land. It's important to acknowledge the labor, the stolen labor um, of uh, the enslaved uh, through the African um, slave trade. Um, and it's important for us to understand that the ancestry of all of that and the history of all, that, all of that lives here in this building, in these walls, and in our very uh, space, in the very space that we're occupying right now. 
And the reason why that's important is because oftentimes we forget the evolution of that history. We wouldn't be here unless we understood um, how the, the work and the sweat equity of our ancestors got us to where we are. So that acknowledgement is always important. Um, in the last several months, I've had the privilege to be in a couple of like really amazing places. I spent some time in New Zealand with the Maori people. I spent some time in uh, Sydney and got to see and experience the Aborigine people. And then most recently I was in Utah and got to experience being in the land of our uh, first peoples of this country. And one of the things that I realized is that in every single opening ceremony, whether I was in New Zealand with the Maori people or in Australia with the Aborigine people or in Utah here in this country with the indigenous people, they always talked about the lands that they're from and, and opened with their ancestry. So in honor of that, something that I've adopted, I hope you adopt something from me and be like, you know, one day I saw this lady and she was talking and I love the way that she did X, Y, and Z. And now I'm talking to you and I'm adop adopting that. So my ancestry is that I am Afro-Caribbean. I come from the traditional lands of Española, which is now broken in two halves, the Dominican Republic and Haiti. I have ancestors from both sides of the land. So two pieces of land that often don't get along, sometimes somehow develop a love child that now is able to speak to you about the land. Um, my great, great, great grandmother was uh, sold into enslavement and worked in a plantation um, in uh, the Dominican Republic side. And then her daughter after her was sold into indentured servitude. And then my mother after her was um, abandoned by my grandmother. So my great grandmother abandoned my grandmother, my grandmother abandoned my mother. And as such, there was a legacy in my family um, that is tied to enslavement, that is tied to the history of abandonment, right? And so that's something that I carry. I carry with me, I carry it in my blood, I carry it in my DNA, and I carry it in every single space that I occupy. I have to be very aware of that. Awareness about self is so important because sometimes when we're interacting with other people, particularly our patients, we forget, you know, that old ideology of the blank slate. Who believes in that anymore? Y'all believe in that? <laughs> All right. So um, so those are my acknowledgments. It's um, very uh, near and dear to my heart. And I hope that um, it's something that you're thinking about as I'm bringing it to your conscious awareness about what your family lineage is all about. So I wanted to start with this picture because sometimes a picture says a thousand words, right? And the premise of this, um, this day of gathering here today is, is about the invisible obstacles that we face. But I thought, hmm, for the purposes of today, should I talk about it from a space of invisibility or should I talk about it projecting what the invisible really looks like, right? So I wanna ask you, and if you have two brave souls, right? When you think about this, what was the first impression that, that first thing that came to your mind, and don't censor, because y'all are very good at censoring. I know you are, because this is what you do for a living. Tell me what was the first reaction that you felt when you saw that? Yes. Mm -hmm. What else? Determination. What else? Exhaustion. Mm. Exhaustion. Mm -hmm. The magnitude of, uh, of the obstacle. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really striking, right? Because I think that sometimes we can talk about the obstacles in theory. You know, we're really good at intellectualizing almost anything. Right. I mean, by practice and by profession, we can intellectualize anything. But the emotionality behind what must happen in order to overcome the obvious is not always so obvious. And so why I chose this picture is because sometimes we need a mental representation of when we're feeling absolutely exhausted because we've dealt with, you know, three microaggressions as our coffee break. We dealt with four micro assaults during lunch. We dealt with six um, 
ex explicit pieces of racism during dinner, you know, and then we're wondering why by the time we sit down and we're in the bed, we're exhausted, right? So this is a representation of why you're exhausted. And then on top of that, your job is to absorb everybody else's issues that they bring to you, their trauma, their history, their depression, their anxiety, and you have to navigate your way around all of that, right? And still show up for people day in and day out. Yes? Wait, did you have a question? Oh, no, I'm thinking. Jump in, because I'm interactive. I'm thinking about the ignorance of the inequality. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's not there. What is the difference? What is the difference? Yeah. How he Mm -hmm. And he looking at her like, we ready? ready? <laughs> you ready to go? Because <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that what you're speaking to is to say like, hey, who, whose responsibility is it to make sure that there's awareness about the obstacles? Because I certainly know what my obstacles are because they're right in front of me. But do you know what my obstacles are? And if you don't know, should you know? Right? So I, I think that that is such an important part of this representation. So this is level setting, right? We, 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 we're level setting, we're gonna start off high, right? right off the bat. So the invisibly obvious, so important. All right, let's talk a little bit about this. You know, I think one of the things that Nadia, when we were talking about my talk, that she wanted to make sure that I addressed um, here with you all is like, well, what do social determinants look like? Again, another word that we throw around that's really loaded right? Social determinants can mean so many things. For the purposes of today, I'm going to a little bit talk about racism, although there are different components to that. Um, and the reason I'm going to talk about it is because that's been my life's work. My life's work has been around the intersection of racism and mental health. And what does that look like for people? What does that look like in terms of our definition in our society? What does that look like as we conceptualize the way that we uh, encounter and engage our clients um, and our patients in the everyday work of mental health. Um, and, and so she mentioned one of the books that I wrote that, um, that will be out in the, uh, the gallery area, uh, Urban Trauma. And what Urban Trauma is all about, it's, it's about the legacy of racism as it relates to mental health. Oftentimes we don't realize that people's normative reaction to racism is consistently over pathologized and over diagnosed. And we do that in the absence of having an understanding of what it means when racism attacks the mental wellness and mental well-being of people of color. So this provides a framework for what that looks like. The first piece of that is to look at it from a historical lens, right? What are the historical things that have happened that perpetuate racism uh, one generation after another generation after another generation. And so there's social political things that have happened in this country, around the world. They've happened to many populations of color, but in particular in this country to the indigenous people and to those of African descent. The second piece that I talk a lot about are bi is biology and genetics. Because oftentimes what we say in the absence of thinking about active racism or explicit racism is like, well, it's not how it used to be, right? Have you ever heard anybody say that? It's not the same anymore. I mean, y'all have freedom, right? And so it's really interesting to sort of think about, well, when those, in the absence of that, that social political atmosphere and climate being present, then how is it that we can still acknowledge that racism is very much alive and well. Well, one of the things that happens is that epigenetic studies have now demonstrated that there is a trauma gene that we pass on from one generation to another. It's called the FKBP5. And that genetic marker, what it does is that through fetal programming, so when we're talking about maternal health, and we all know the statistics, particularly around black women and maternal health, right? Is that, you know, high deaths in maternal, high fetal deaths, high deaths in the mother, you know, but while the programming is happening, 
What is also occurring is the transmission of intergenerational trauma or historical trauma. And, and so it's a, it's a vulnerability gene. It's there. Sometimes it's activated right away. Sometimes it's not. It all really depends on the environment and what's happening around that child and that family. So genetics are very important because we do pass it down. Now, has anybody gone to a, done a physical in the last few months? Y'all don't do physicals? <laughs> okay, this room. <laughs> I will have time later to have a discussion about your wellness. Okay, have you ever done a physical? Okay, good, all right, all right. And you know you're filling out that sheet with a million questions before they actually see you, family history of diabetes, is your mama, your daddy, you know, who has it, grandma, grandpa. Okay, and then there's like a whole front page, back page. Has anybody ever seen trauma? Uh, mental health? Uh, mental illness, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so we're starting to see that, po I would say post-COVID. Before COVID, nobody even mentioned it, right? Because the linkage between physical health and mental health was something that was very disparate, right? They, they just weren't two things that were connected or that we talked about. It's almost like mind, body, were like, we, we, we weren't one. And that's not, we all know that that's not how it works. So it's so important to start talking about trauma from the perspective of the idea that it is and can and will be passed down from one generation to another. What does that mean for you in terms of the implications of that? It means that when you are discussing and conceptualizing your cases, you have to think about the role of racism in that person that you're seeing, whether historically, genetically, or current day, right? Because all of that will exacerbate the symptomatology that you're seeing in very different ways. And then the last piece are the environmental pieces, right? Whether you're talking about housing, government, laws, policies, institutions, you name it, all of the pieces where racism has penetrated the structure and it's been normalized to, for us to believe and think that this is the way that it should operate although it operates from a space of oppression, of bias, of discrimination. So those three factors, when we talk about ra uh, racial trauma or what I've called urban trauma, are deep-rooted and are multifaceted and happening all at the same time. Okay, so then people tell me, you know what, Dr. Akbar, I hear you, right? But, you know, we're doing different with mental health. We're doing different. And, you know, the stigma has now been significantly reduced. We have all these online apps. You know, I have easy access. I see more of my folks, you know, calling and, and making appointments for, for treatment. I see more representation, which I will challenge at any moment, of us in the field, um, you know, et cetera. But what I like to do is I like to go back to history. Y'all see I like history, right? You know why? Tell me why. You don't know me, but tell me why you think I like history so much. Yes, ma'am. Bam. If you don't want to change something, don't know your history. If you do want to change and break legacies and cycles, understand your history and where you come from and how you got here. So if you don't understand the history of your profession, do you know what you're representing? Okay. So let's start. Let's start. We're going to church now. Okay. <laughs> 1600s, Europeans isolate mentally ill people, segregating them as delinquents and vagrants, right? Vagrants. And you know what, what that was directly tied to? If an enslaved person tried to run away from a plantation, get, guess what they were called? Crazy. And there's specific names that they were given, like draptomania, like they had illnesses, right? These illnesses. You can look it up, actually. You can Google it right now if you don't believe me. And something called draftomania was what a diagnosis that was given for an enslaved person running away from a plantation. Now, help me. Help me. Right? Because this is the history. And most often, if they were taken to an asylum, which is where the crazy people who ran away from the plantation were taken, guess what happened while they were in the asylum? What's that? Oh. 
treated well. They treat well. Okay, let me go with that. Let me run with it. Okay, treatment. What kind of treatment you think they got? That's right. I'm going to experiment on your body to see what's happening with your brain that makes you crazy, that makes you run away from the plantation. And then I'm going to determine, I'm going to write theory around this and determine what's wrong with you. And then here comes the evolution of human hierarchy. The difference between humans based on race. Now, what do we know about race? Y'all, if you don't tell me. Yes, thank you, ma'am. It's a social construct that was created specifically for the reason of determining human hierarchy. I am better than you because I have less melanin than you because I this, because fill in the blank, right? And so one of the reasons this theory started was based on this type of, you know, th this is the foundation of our discipline, right? And so we go through years of reform. We go through um, Samuel Cartwright, who starts to write about um, uh, draftomania, which is the, the, the disorder that I talked to you about, a diagnosis of why slaves didn't want to work. Ciao. Um, th then we move into asylums, and we have asylums that are, that are uh, you know, in Georgia, in North Carolina, um, you know, more asylums for the colored insane people, right? More asylums in Virginia and Bama right here. We have Alabama Colored Insane Hospital where you had 350 patients admitted that were described insane solely for those purposes back in the 1800s, right? And then we start theories around intelligence. Who's more intelligent than the other? Again, based on human hierarchy, based on theory that is absolutely not true because race is what? A social construct. It doesn't exist. We made it up. When we say social construct, I mean, I made it up. I mean, I sat in my hotel room and I was like, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to go into this meeting. I'm going to be like, y'all, race is real, right? And then because I have a PhD behind my name, y'all going to believe me. And then I'm going to write some books about it. Not real, right? And so we go on and on and on and you see the history all the way back from the 1600s, right? And then you see that theorist Theories that you probably studied, tests that you took and you had to memorize, you know, about Skinner and about Eric Erickson's theories, right, of self-actualization. Well, let me ask you, which of us was self-actualizing back in the 1940s? Because I sure wasn't, well, I wasn't even born then, but let me stop. See, I, I take on the spirit of my ancestors, right? And so what... This is how this evolution happens. So even when therapy was made available to folks, do you think that it was made available to people of color? Now, who was therapy for? What's that? White women. Who said that? Yes, white women. That's right. The well-kept white woman. Hysterical, well-kept white women. That's right. Right? And so then that lasted for decades. Um, and, and so, it, is it how y'all feel now that you know this? <laughs> well, I can't stand here and say that. <laughs> but talk to me later. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it is a very different approach to the evolution of something, right? And so, I, this understanding is is very important because we want to make sure that we're representing the work that we do, the modalities that we use, the therapeutic evidence base, I can throw them out, right? Like the EBT and the EVTs and all the E's that exist, right? Because we love an acronym, right? All of those things, where was the origin of that? And how am I utilizing those tools today to either help or harm? Because I'm not understanding the history of where that came from. So I'm just gonna leave that there. You can always grab that, and it's in the book. I, I mean, I did all of this research vetted so that you didn't have to look for it. It's here. Okay, so I want to talk to, now that I gave you doom and gloom, sorry. I got to set you up for like the real bad stuff. I want to talk about then how do we change structures and systems, right? Because I think that it's important to talk about the history, but it's also important to talk about mobilization, collective mobilization, right? And so one of the things that I, might, I do is that uh, through my work, uh, while I am not here today representing uh, APA, 
I do hold a position at the American Psychological Association, but I have to have that disclaimer that I'm not here representing them today. Um, a lot of the work that I'm doing there is about systemic and structural change. So I'm gonna go from your left to this right. Uh, here I'm at the podium uh, because in 2021, for the first time in APA's 130 year history, we issued a formal apology to communities of color for the historical harms that we have done to the community through omission, commission, implicit and explicit discrimination, through the fact that our founding father was also explicitly uh, writing uh, books and, and lectures around human hierarchy and the differences between human based on race. And so that was a moment of reckoning for the association. It was a moment where we had to take responsibility for that harm. And it was a moment where we needed to understand that an apology beyond an apology on paper and words is meaningless unless we activate action. And action is only done through the process of repair and reconciliation with communities, right? And we needed to be able to do that. What you see after that is, uh, the policy-making body for the association is called the Council of Representatives. And the Council of Representatives is a body of 196 psychologists from different states, divisions, I mean, you name them, prolific psychologists in their field. And they all sit there and they look at the policy that you're passing in front of them. It is rarely a group, as you probably would think, with psychologists or mental health practitioners that agrees on almost anything, right? So getting 100% passage on an apology that will now be instituted as policy of the association was a miracle. So after that, I should have shown you my ugly cry picture that came after that, but I was like, no, I'm not gonna do it. Yes, there was an ugly cry picture because it was a lot of, uh, a, a lot, it took a lot of grit and determination to get that apology passed. There was a trio of resolutions, one that talked about um, creating health equity, one that talked about um, the apology, and one that talked about psychology's unique contribution to changing a variety of different sectors and settings, including education, the scientific enterprise, uh, uh, healthcare. And so these trio of resolutions have now set the standard for how we are operating around our equity, diversity, and inclusion work in the association. Then after that, who you see me with? <laughs> Go ahead. Y'all know the red one at least. Thank you. So I'm, I, I got the pleasure to film a segment uh, at Sesame Street. And you know that what they say, once you've been with a Muppet and who else, there's no stopping you. <laughs> who else beside a Muppet? That's right, Oprah, right? <laughs> so I got one down, one to go, <laughs> right? So, here, what we started to do is messaging to parents, helping parents have conversations about racial stress with their children. And it was a beautiful way of Sesame Street saying, we're going to hit the ground running in terms of activism around educating as many people as we can through our educational programs and Sesame Street communities around how to begin to raise our children with a level of awareness that is so different than the way that perhaps we were raised or that generations before us have been talking about this conversation. In addition to this, there's a whole segment, which by the way, you can use in therapeutic, um, in your therapeutic environments if you work with parents and children. Um, you could just go on Sesame Street communities and start downloading those uh, if you don't have the words or training or capacity to talk about race-based um, stress. There's also an entire segment that, that does this for parents who want to raise children to be good allies. Ain't that duly important, right? Um, so here you, here you start really seeing systemic and structural change, right? You have an association with a long history that has now said, we are committed to this work, we are apologizing, and we're about to hit the ground running. And then the last one that you see here was my, um, the blanket ceremony. Um, which is very special in indigenous community, and it's an honor. It actually is a, 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 it signifies that you are now one of the family. I am now a sibling, um, you know, uh, to the indigenous community. Um, and that happened 
um, because not only do we apologize generally to people of color, but we apologize to the First Peoples because we also had a hand in the indigenous native boarding schools um, and psychologists worked in those boarding schools that abused and killed and uh, you know, uh, had so many other uh, roles in breaking up indigenous families in so many ways and um, ripping out their indigenous culture, right? And so these are the ways in which we began during that ceremony while I'm on stage. I don't know if you can see, I cry a lot. I'm just a crier. So it's like, Lord, she's black. I'm like bawling. Uh, one of the indigenous psychologists gets up and she says, no one has ever apologized to my people. Man. Right? And, and you know, and, and then she said, not only did you heal me, but you healed my line of ancestors who have been waiting for someone just to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did to you, right? So it is powerful. It is powerful. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't engage in the type of systemic change um, that's necessary. Let me do a time check. Okay. This is a video. Do you think I can play it? Let me see. Um, I, I would need some help by folks if, yeah, maybe, um, I'll come back to it so we can, I think it's a really good video and one that you all can always take and adopt in your work. I love to give little snippets of things that, um, are important for us to, yeah, you're going to be, you'll try much better than me. Um, let's see if we can, let me go back here because I think it's important to talk about the inequities and then I'm going to talk about it from an institutional level. When we talk about racism, we have to talk about it in a variety of different levels. Dr. Kamara Jones, if you haven't heard of her, please look her up. She was the one who has, I think, the most prolific definition for looking at systems of racism, you know, and she looks at it again from a systemic structural level, institutional level. And then the other one that we're going to discuss is interpersonal and internalized levels of racism. Um, yeah. What, what do you think? Think we got it? Oh, yeah. We can leave it there. Everybody can see that, right? Okay. Okay. Use gang activity, shootings, drive-bys. You know, there, there are things that are dealing with in which our average kids may not have to deal with. Every day, you know, stuff like, you know, during the night, during the day, well, it doesn't matter. There was shooting, two guys dead, two more hurt, and two more people injured. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Two teenagers were shot outside a busy fast food restaurant. One of the most extensive studies on post traumatic stress disorder in the community was done here in Atlanta. I found the staggering statistic that of those who live in low-income areas in the city, 46% suffered from PTSD. That is a rate much higher even than soldiers who've seen war. Yeah, you letting that sink in? Higher than soldiers who have experienced <laughs> war in one inner city in Atlanta. Spend time in some inner cities and you can understand why children in particular who can sometimes feel like a war zone. War to them may be a local drive-by between gang robbers, you know. War to them may be walking down the street on a, a needle or seeing someone, you know, using drugs. You know, that is war. And these kids see this on a daily basis, so they may think it's normal when, you know, we know it's not. When you look at how the rest of the developed world fares when it comes to gun murders as compared to the U.S., you start to see how many more here must be touched by violence. In the neighborhood, they might hear maybe a car backfiring, and it sounds like a gunshot, and they might have something like a panic response. So they might have increased sweating, increased heart rate response. On a clinical level, what we call that is hypervigilance, is this inability to feel safe. So the brains grow up faster, their biology grows up faster, 
gunshots and, and this violence in the street is something that they're adapting to, and their brain is adapting to it as well, and we can see that on the imaging. In effect, in these neighborhoods, children's brains are measurably growing up faster because of what they're exposed to. That affects their ability to learn, it makes it difficult for them to build relationships, makes them more susceptible to depression and to drug use. Unlike soldiers who come home from war and now they no longer are in that dangerous environment, a lot of the children in this study are still living in that dangerous environment. We were in the camp, and then they started shooting, and then when my camp decided to get on the floor, and get up and get stopped, and then they stopped, and one person died, and the police came. Like, I even witnessed my kids getting off the school bus, and, you know, we heard gunshots from the next complex over. It's hard to make those police. Because sometimes the gun violence, like the gun going off, I can still hear them sometimes, like when they in my ear. Researchers say the levels of PTSD in U.S. inner cities are compared to refugee populations around the world. But that here it goes unrecognized, leaving many to cope alone with the impact. Take a go back to so two things did you all see her affect so my mom told me to get down on the floor and the police came and then two people died two people died and you just telling me that two people died and the, right the, the, the incredible part of that is that she's narrating the story because she has normalized the violence in her life right it's not shocking to her that there's going to be violence or police you know what i don't compete with youtube <laughs> um, I think I missed my calling to be a comedian. That's really what I wanted to be, but instead I became a psychologist. Who knew? Um, so it's so important to sort of take a look at that. A couple years ago, there was a UN report that indicated that based on the violence against Black men in this country, they are actually in the category to be able to seek asylum. Y'all heard me? Based on the level of violence, I'm going to repeat it, because y'all took a little nap. It was like that sandwich sitting in. <laughs> Based on the level of violence against Black men in this country, they fit the category to seek asylum, to leave this country and go somewhere else for their safety. That's what asylum seekers do. Often they come here from other countries that are war and torn, and they're, you know, uh, th there's a violence happening against them or their families. But that is the level of violence that is occurring in this country, right? So there's a, a report from the United Nations. The other thing that I'll talk about, because she sort of made the compar comparison to US veterans, there's a study that came out of the University of Ghana where the professors there tracked, um, you know, well, what does it look like? You know, does it, is this thing about like epigenetics and historical trauma really real, right? Like can we track uh, the, uh, the DNA over time to see whether like this thing about racial trauma is still activated? So they did a comparison study looking at several generations of those that were ancestors of the Holocaust and several generations of those that were ancestors of the transatlantic slave trade in the Ivory Coast, in the West Coast of, of, um, of Africa. And guess what they found? Marker. That's right. Much more prevalent as part of a genetic marker. And perhaps maybe that's not a surprise. Y'all like, okay, Dr. Akbar, I could have intuitively, you know, told you that. But here's the one that I would like to ask. Why? Why would it be more prevalent in the ancestors of the enslaved and not be as prevalent in the ancestors of those that were victims of the Holocaust? It's not, it's, not it's not over. Every day, the acts of racism, no matter how small or big, continue to happen. So absent of traumatic environment, you cannot get rid of the trauma that you pass down. You see what I'm saying? It's real, right? So 
I want to give you an idea then what is what happens then institutionally, right? Okay, I'll talk about system, systemic change. Let's talk real quick about ins institutional change because maybe a lot of you represent institutions. One of the things that we did a couple years ago in Connecticut is that we partnered with the Connecticut Department of Children and Families. And it was a three-way partnership. Um, Connecticut uh, Children and Families, uh, my work around urban trauma, and Dr. Niffley's work, if you don't know him, Stephen Niffley, he's out of the University of Kentucky, although he may have moved to another university now, who writes extensively about racial trauma treatment. Right? So I talk about racial trauma in terms of conceptualization, and he's on the other side of that coin in terms of treatment. And what we did is that we partnered together and they created what's called an Urban Trauma Institute, where a collection of mental health, most of them grassroots, mental health agencies got trained on the urban trauma model and also on Dr. Nifley's model of racial trauma treatment. And it's a complementary um, treatment process, a parallel complementary treatment process to traditional therapy. So those children that we know that have been identified um, that come into therapy, children or adults, right, can have an urban trauma therapist treat their symptomatology that is a result of racial trauma. And then if there are other issues related to, you know, uh, depression and anxiety and, you know, bipolar or anything else, then they go into the traditional treatment route. But what we want to do first is say, hold on. Are we labeling something that is, that is not because the symptoms look the same? And the symptoms look the same, but the origin is different. Because if I talk to you about a schizophrenia, the brain chemistry behind the schizophrenic brain and a brain that has been exposed to trauma is very different now, isn't it? But sometimes if I've been stopped five, six, 10 times by police, and every time I hear a siren, whoop, whoop, I'm like, you know, looking around and I'm hypervigilant, what does that look like to somebody when I come into their therapy office, right? So you start looking at symptoms and they begin to mirror other things that are really based on the traumatic experience that's happening. So it's important to have that level of awareness and not only that level of awareness, but an engagement and a commitment to institutional change, educating clinicians, black, white, and everything in between to help understand what this actually looks like so that we are not part of the problem, we are part of the solution, right? That's how institutional change happens. So we don't have to keep looking at people like, look at that one resilient child that made it. <laughs> if I hear one more time about resiliency, right? Stop placing the responsibility on the kid. Change the structure and maybe we can see this entire blooming community instead of that one resilient child that everybody tells a story about, right? Don't get home of a okay. <laughs> okay, so here, I just wanna be able to demonstrate some of the characteristics that may come up, right, when you see it. I I've seen people who, have who come in and we've had a conversation about racial trauma and there are folks that can see a video on Facebook, or on Instagram about an incident of police brutality. And they're like, you know, I was just literally cooking. And then all of a sudden, my anger, I could not calm myself down. I couldn't go to sleep. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't stop perseverating. I had to protect my children. I had to start walking my children to school. I was like, you better not wear that hoodie. No more hoodies. I took all the hoodies out of the, you know, and on and on and on, right? Because these issues are real. They create uh, 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 errors in your perception, in your environment. They create mistrust. Sometimes you have to manipulate systems just to be able to get by, right? You fear, and look, how many of us, and this one I like to personalize because I think that it, is, it rings so true. How many of us even sitting here, because we have to acknowledge it, right? Not only fear the unknown, fear our failure, but hello, even our success. Because what happens when you're successful? Talk to me later about it, right? And then when we carry the lens of rejection, I mean, if you talk about the biggest existential crisis of rejection, is this country's rejection? <laughs> it's 
to black people. You're not American. You don't belong here. Right? So imagine how we see the world. Rejection, abandonment. Am I accepted? Am I real? Am I an imposter? Do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you understand me? Right? How much do I have to prove that I belong? I just belong. Right? All right, I'm going to wrap up. I'm landing a plane. <laughs> landing a plane. Okay, so now I've talked to you about structural and systemic. I've talked to you about institutional. And there's something that happens in us. What they say, broken people, you know, that's right. Hurt people hurt people. I'll be like, broken people break people. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to work on that one, though. I'm going to think about that. Um, so what happens with us when we are engaging with one another, which is the interpersonal part that occurs? But what happens with us when we start to believe the rhetoric, right, that we have been delivered so long that we cannot, uh, we, you know, we have to decode it from, from our brains. We have to go through a process of like, you know, uh, letting all of that go. And unless you're able to right size that and people give you the truth around it and you have folks, a village, a tribe around you that supports you, it's really hard to do that. You know, to deprogram your brain from what it is, what's known and what has been passed down. So y'all clinicians, or at least the majority are, and if you're not and you play one on TV, that's fine too, because you know what, you on camera say hello. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a quick case study. I got like, six, oops, oop, five, who, what? Okay, I got a couple minutes. Five, oh, she said five. Now I'm not gonna talk to you about how you took my time, but that's all right. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> She's like, I just came in from the bathroom. <laughs> I was trying to be helpful. She just raised my, my trauma response. <laughs> my cortisol levels are high now. <laughs> I'm sorry, sis. I'm just playing with you. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to give you a live example of what it looks like when you do a traumatic experience to somebody who was an innocent bystander. <laughs> Thank you so much. You didn't even know you were playing. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about um, what we know how to do best, right? Case conceptualization, really quickly. Potential diagnosis, don't worry. Don't tell me, I don't know everything. It's okay. I want you to guess. You're not going to get tested on this. Your supervisor's not going to say anything bad about you. You know, and potential prognosis. Can we do that? Case conceptualization, potential diagnosis, and prognosis. Okay, so we got a kid. The kid is uh, an immigrant to this country, perhaps some language barriers, intergenerational poverty, uh, uh, family migrated to avoid conflicts at home, history of abandonment, broken family, food insecurities, place in special education, right? Labeled as a problematic youth um, and just doesn't seem to trust anyone. All right, come on. Case conceptualization. I'm out. Okay, special ed kid. Disability. Okay, what else? Out of diagnosis. What are we thinking? ADHD, what else? Oppos oppositional defiant, what else? Adjustment disorder, what else? Person, maybe even a personality disorder, okay. Depression, abandonment issues, but give me a, a, give me a diagnosis. What, what, reactive attachment maybe? Reactive attachment, okay, okay, what else? Impulse control, okay. We done? Prognosis. What happens to this kid? Straight to jail. Medication. Labeled. Labeled as what? It's fan on that. Right. So okay. So it, like right. It's not just one. Well, no more axes. But like, you you've got a list of diagnoses that now carries that kid around, sometimes into adulthood and into other areas of their lives. Right. Okay. What else? Stigma. Yeah, because what do they think about themselves? If you're being labeled, on, that's what people are calling you, right? What else? Either homeless or marginally housed. Homeless or marginally housed. Definitely dropping out of school. 
Detention. School detention. Prison time squad. Right. Oh, I didn't even talk about that. That's a whole other talk show. See me in another channel for that one. Anything else? Good. Okay. So you want me to tell you what happened to this kid? Paranoid. Oh, somebody was like, hold on. <laughs> paranoid. Okay, so maybe some paranoia, schizoid, like that kind of, okay. What's that? There? Go ahead. I heard you, but it's like my bad ear. What was that? <laughs> All right. Anything else? Aw, I love that. Gets rescued. The child gets rescued by a good clinician. Ready? All right. That child is me. Goes on to change the world. Sometimes you think you're not making a difference. Sometimes you think you're not reaching them. Sometimes you think they left there because they can't hear you and they don't want to work. Sometimes you think that they're never going to change. Sometimes you think their story is their destination. But every time you think that, I want you to remember this moment. I want you to remember when I talk to you about the systemic and structural change. I want you to remember how I led the association and their apology to people of color. I want you to remember how we can do this work together if you change one child, one person at a time. If your passion today, which is where I began, was to become a mental health clinician so that you can support and help people tap into that passion because that passion will create the next person that will change the world. You hear me? Don't you ever leave here the same. You can't unsee and unhear what you heard and saw today. So now you have a responsibility to be different. All right? Y'all got me? All right. Don't make me cry because I'm a crier. Hold on, I'm a crier. You want to hug me? You want to hug? You want to hug? <laughs> I want to hug. I need a hug. I need a hug. I need a hug. I need a hug. <laughs> okay, so we're going to wrap it up. I have two things that I want to say. Right there was somebody who stepped into my life and disrupted. Her name is Miss Freeman. I love her forever. I've written letters to her. I've tried to look for her. She was my fifth grade teacher. And she was like, Misa, you are destined for greatness. Misa, you are destined for greatness. And she engraved that in my brain. And I believed her. I dared to believe her. Right? Y'all are destined for greatness. But it all begins with us. That means we have to start changing our mindset. We can't start thinking about everything from a mindset of scarcity. We got to start thinking of things in abundance. What can you do versus what can't you do? Not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Change the question. When you're doing your intake, what happened to you? Tell me what happened to you. Tell me your story. Everybody got a story. I got a story. Tell me what happened to you, right? Because then you can move people from unhealthy relationships to secure attachments from hopelessness to thinking about endless possibilities, from accepting the dysfunction as the norm to saying, absolutely not. My norm, my metric, my bar needs to be emotional and mental wellness at all costs, right? To thinking about, I'm alone at this. Nobody sees me. Nobody believes me. Nobody understands me to saying, I'm confident. I walk in my power. I have agency in every room that I walk into, right? to thinking about I'm resilient because I want to be resilient. I'm not resilient as a result of the structures that made me have to be resilient. That's a difference, right? You can overcome because you want to overcome. So I leave you with this because collective action is necessary. And sometimes we think about the systems that we need to change 
but we don't think about the people that make up the systems that need to change. And you are the people that make up the systems that need to change. And here's where it starts. Thank you for inviting me into your space. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to me and my story. And I hope that I hear from you in one way or another and that Nadia and Co can tell me the great things that y'all be doing after this. She's doing something really powerful here, y'all. Help her, support her, nurture her, right? Because this is what helps us grow and to change system. Thank you, everybody. Um, so LinkedIn is, is a really great platform. What, you, what you'll see is a continuation of my work there. I post everything. And not only do I post stuff, but if there are internships, job openings, like you name it, I also give you resources, all kinds of different things. Um, you can always reach me via, um, if, well, I have, you know, like people who, you know, uh, who you can connect with that then connect with me if you need something. The book is a, an incredible resource for you um, if you need to sort of get caught up on all this work. And then if you have any questions, what I can promise Nadia is that I'm very good at this, actually. I try to respond to um, every question that comes in. Send it to her, and then I promise you that I will get back in touch with you to answer your questions. Okay? That's my commitment and my promise to you. All right? Urban trauma. And it's next door. We have them available next door. They're available they next door. Available next door. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then uh, Beyond Ally is the complimentary book for those that want to learn how to be good allies to communities of color. So. Awesome. Can we give Dr. Oprah another hand clap for her awesome work, her courageous heart, and her bravery to be bold in a space that does not look like her, right? Oh. How many times do we go into a space and it doesn't look like us and it doesn't sound like us and we find ourselves lost in our authenticity? And Dr. Albert, I just want to say thank you for your authenticity because you could have given us the Yale version of you, right? <laughs> I could have. <laughs> but she came in authentic. And so thank you so much for being your awesome sister self. And we truly appreciate the work you're doing and continue to do the work. And welcome to the South. This is your first time. It is my first time. <laughs> so welcome to the South. Thank you so much. All right, y'all. We're going to do a 10-minute break. We're going to get Dr. Oprah back on her plane to her plane. So give a 10-minute break. And then if you want to, in the vendor room, her book is available. So um, it is um, ready to be sold. So both books out there. And can we give Sis here a free book from me? Because, uh, I, because I stressed out her nervous system when she came in. And you, you're deserving of that book and more. Okay? <laughs> Thank you, y'all.